you so much for having me. Um, so there will be pictures of human skeletal remains. Most of them are published in widely distributed um, publications, but I, I don't want anybody to be caught off, caught off guard. So this would be a good time to leave. Um, okay, so Southwest Research. There is so much Southwest, re Southwest Research. There are books about change over time. Um, hold on one minute. I need my glasses. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, so change over time, ex research that explains various alliances that have been made, research on climate change, diet, subsistence, food, community networks, um, the rise and fall of Chaco. Hopefully these are all, and, the, and obviously this talk, I'm sorry, I want to mention that I'm mostly dealing with ancestral Pueblo in the more Four Corners regions, not so much the Hohokam or Mogollon. Um, early Pueblo adaptations, cosmology and religion, regional interactions, oral tradition, kinship, migration. This is overwhelming, is it not? Because for every one of these books that have come out, there's probably a hundred peer-reviewed journal articles to read as well. The, the amount of research in the American Southwest is, is voluminous and you can hardly keep up with it. In terms of violence and warfare, not so hard to keep up with it. Um, we have the major work by Polly Shafsma looking at iconographic petroglyphs and various symbols that um, she believes are uh, symbolic of um, warfare. And then we have two books, largely one edited and one written by Steve Blanc and one by Hassan Kramer that take on notions of warfare and violence in the ancient Southwest. Very few of these use data derived from the human remains. <clears throat> they might review it, they might um, make reference to it, but except for two pieces of um, research that have come out in the last 15, 20 years, um, that research is largely not incorporated into any of these large, really quite um, um, uh, systematic and broad assessments of, of trying to understand peer, um, Pueblo people over time. The two books that have made a bit of an impact and are used by archaeologists are the two that are on um, cannibalism, one by Tim White and one by Christy Turner and his wife, that came out in 1992 and 1998. And I'm, I'm on record pretty much saying that I don't agree with the interpretations of this research, and 20 years later I still don't agree with it, but I've thought a lot more and a lot more broadly about what I do think is going on. And so I'll use some of their research, but I'm going to give you a slightly different way to think about it. Incidentally, there was a book that came out that pretty much demolished these two pieces of work, but very few people have read it and even fewer people cite it. Um, but it really takes on this notion that from these small set of markers on human remains, you can make something as broad as cannibalism be the interpretation. Um, so there's a lot of chapters in this book. It's still a very relevant book, and if you wanted to kind of read um, some of the real basic under, underpinnings of the kind of t what I'm going to talk about tonight, this would be a good place to start. Um, and that came out in about 10 years after the cannibalism book. So although this is a dated scenario, a model, if you will, of kind of general patterns in ancestral Pueblo Four Corners region over time from 600 to about 1600 AD, um, it's dated, but it's, it's it's referenced a lot in even very recent literature that came, up, came out as recently as 2014 and 2015. Um, this is fundamentally a way to sort of think about major ceremonial centers over time that rose and collapsed. So you have Chaco and then Aztec and then a movement into Mexico at Pacime. And then this, this notion of something happened kind of in this middle period covers Pueblo II, Pueblo III. Um, that even if you don't believe it's cannibalism, something was going on that caused people to take human bodies and reduce them, do some kinds of mechanical, cultural processing of the bodies that reduce them. Um, and that this has kind of defined this moment. Many archeologists have spent a lot of time, especially Steve LeBlanc, trying to summarize what we know from the archeological record about violence and warfare. They rely primarily on <coughs> architecture, artifacts from sites, um, placement of sites, and these primarily suggest that in the P1, this earliest period, there was warfare, but it was of the kind of small scale, hand on hand, um, it was feuding, kind of a low level uh, set of activities. And then those seem to diminish, and then you have a rise 
um, somewhere <coughs> at the end of P3 and moving into P4 of what they call real warfare. A lot of defensive structures, people really seem to be afraid. You do find some actual massacre events um, and you see a lot of migration at the beginning of this period. However you, even if you think these models are dated and, and you have your own ideas about what was really going on, um, these are used a lot and there, there's variations on the theme, so there's the one I showed you. Some people do not dis discount this, this thing based on the human remains that suggests that there was something going on in the P2 period and try to connect at least warfare with things like droughts resource, um, uh, ha not having resources. Um, the, the fall of Chaco has been sort of considered to be a push or a stimulus factor. So, but no matter how these models end up being sort of tinkered with by various scholars, I, I would say most papers still fall into this sort of model, which has, um, the only difference is that <clears throat> Instead of calling these remains disarticulated, which disarticulated, most burials, it, it just means they're not normal burials, that we don't see the bodies in the position of a full body that then lost its soft tissue and over time, um, we still find that it's articulated. So disarticulated, some people thought, was, was not a term that captured what we were really seeing. And it was Chris, Kristen Kunkelman at Crow Canyon that came up with a term that she felt was better and she called these e things extreme processing events. So these EP events have replaced in the literature people talking about disarticulated um, assemblages that have been cannibalized to uh, this extreme processing which has occurred in different times in different places um, that might have been cannibalism, but if you don't believe that, then it was, but it was something really bad. So most of the models um, sort of play around with that. As I said, the warfare is not based on burial data. That's completely based on site location, fortifications, the, the um, presence of towers, of watchtowers, the presence of sort of fortified walls, the notion that people were trying to kind of bombard themselves somewhere where they could see people approaching and be able to protect themselves. Um, just I want to take a tiny detour into my own um, thinking about violence and violence theory. I've been teaching two courses for about 25 years. One's called the Anthropology of Violence. Um, and a more recent thing I've been doing is called Global Health in Times of Violence. And I draw on anthropological literature from all four fields, archaeological, evolutionary, linguistic, um, uh, contemporary ethnography of wars and warfare. Um, and one of the things uh, I wanted to just read for you is that this quote really captures my own thinking about what violence is. I mean, we all know violence when we see it, or do we? Um, here's a quote. Rather than viewing violence then simply as a set of discrete events, the perspective I am at, at advancing seeks to unearth those entrenched processes of ordering the social world, world and making um, <clears throat> sorry, and making or realizing culture that themselves are forms of violence, violence that is multiple, mundane, um, and perhaps all the more fundamental because it is hidden often or secretive violence out of which um, images of people are shaped. And then the second thing I want to sort of emphasize is that relying on a variety of theories about the nature of violence with non-lethal forms of violence included. Not everybody dies, and it might be just as important to look at the survivors of violence than just those that succumb. Um, that you can, you can start to draw upon um, readings that highlight the underlying processes, historical, cultural, environmental, and biological, that emphasize the ways that violence creates situations of poor health for not only soldiers and warriors, but also for the non-combatants or the women and children. And so you can sort of see where I'm coming from violence. It's, I, I care very much about the Southwest. I've been working in the Southwest for the last 35 years. But my questions about violence are big. They're about what's going on in Syria today. They're about what went on in Croatia between um, Bosnian and Serbian um, forces. It's about what went down in Rwanda between the Hutu and the Tutsi. So I want to understand what motivates, and I also want to be able to make meaning of it, because I'm not in those cultures, and neither are you. It's really hard to get what, what anthropologists call an emic perspective, to get inside a culture and really try to make meaning of a deeply ingrained set of ideological um, 
beliefs and customs and rules and regulations that they have if you're looking at it from the outside. So that's where I'm coming from. From my own research, you can see none of my books here are specifically about the Southwest, and that's because I'm really interested in the question of violence more than any one culture. But I realized that by going cross-culturally and going through time, so those two different axes, it just opens up the way that we can come to understand and think about violence. So my own feeling about violence is that it is at the core of social relations. It's not chaos, it's not dropped out of the sky, it's not necessarily evil. Of course it's hurtful, the whole, one of the underlying things is that violence is about hurting other people or killing them. But if you think about it writ large, it is at the core of social relations, just as is religion, economics, politics, kinship, marriage patterns, etc. So that's my number one belief, and I'll go to my grave believing this. Also, violence is a cultural process, so that it's infinitely variable. That's why there is no gene for violence, there is no ethnicity for violence. It is so variable. As we go from culture to culture, if you step back and read 20 different narratives about 20 different acts of violence, you will see it is infinitely innovative in the way that people can carry it out. That there are big, huge patterns like warfare. But those don't tell you the nitty gritty of who's on the ground, who's most at risk, who are the combatants, who are the non-combatant. That's infinitely variable. And finally, violence is relational. As you move through time, because of historic things that have led to a moment of violence, it can be different depending if one person is interacting here or if they're interacting with somebody else, that it's very relational, so it's dynamic. It's got sort of a more than even three dimensions going on to it, so that any time you see one thing and label it something, my guess is you're actually, it's probably wrong what you're, what you're tending to call something. But these things are very nuanced. Acts of violence are nuanced, and people innovate with them all the time. At the same time, these acts are very um, culturally sturdy. They can persist over thousands, maybe, of generations, certainly hundreds and certainly tens of hundreds. Um, finally, violence is really symbolic. So I'm not talking here about homicides. I'm really talking about culturally sanctioned. And I'm using sanction as when, when the culture says, well, this is good. We've got to go out and we've got to kill all those people. So let's get guns for these people and let's send them out there. So I'm talking about cultural violence, which is part of the social core of how a community decides that they want to interact with other communities. Um, and it's mostly writ large in symbolism, that a lot of what goes down in warfare, the prep for warfare, the, the conversations about warfare, tend to be really symbolic, so that people only need to see one thing, a US flag, and they immediately start to get what the message is there. It's the same every single culture, and I believe it's the same in the past. And we haven't been very good in the archaeological record of looking for all the symbolic ways that violence is being communicated to not just the victims who may or may not die, but the audience that a lot of these um, acts of violence are directed towards. There's usually a perpetrator, a victim, and an audience. So violence is very symbolic, and I think we've kind of um, just decided we can't deal with that in the archaeological record, so we haven't been very good at looking for it, but I do think it's there. Most people who study violence use a, what's called the um, pyramid or the violence framework. There is direct violence. You know it when you see it. Somebody hits somebody, somebody beats somebody up, somebody knifes somebody. That's direct physical violence. Around the world, when you see that, you know it. But that may not be what's most important about violence. What's most important about violence is that that physical violence is tied to structural violence. Now this is where the nitty gritty to understanding why we have violence in human societies is. That structural violence is the, are these codes of conduct, ideological practices, political economic customs that benefit from certain forms of violence being carried out. Um, one of my Mentors used to say, if violence is the answer, what was the question? And what he was suggesting is that violence solves problems for somebody. It may not be your problem, but it's a perceived problem that somebody has. And they think by using violence, they're gonna somehow be able to benefit from whatever the after effects of this violence is. 
So structural violence then um, can also be that more subtle way of denying resources to some people and giving resources to others. So structural violence can be thinking about, well, why is it that mostly people in the poor parts of town are the targets of all kinds of homicides and other kinds of violence in this culture? Um, so that often political economics, status, violence, these are all kind of tied in this web of structures that keep violence around. And finally, most importantly for anthropologists, is structural, cultural or ritual violence. This is the stuff that makes all the other violence seem normal. This is the stuff why every time they say they're going to send troops to Afghanistan or they're going to send troops to Syria, nobody even bats an eyelid because we have this, this sort of underlying ideology that we're doing this to protect ourselves, that we have vested interests, you know, we, you, you can come up with your own reasons. So cultural violence makes direct and structural violence look and feel normal for the culture that is enacting that violence. Um, the audience participates and approves. The perpetrators and victims actually know what's going on. Often the victims know that they're going to be targeted, that they're the victims, that all of this is sort of a code that's written into the way people come to understand what appropriate behavior in, um, in uh, social groups is. It, you get it in school, you get it everywhere. So you can take these ideas and move them to the past and start to think about, well, what would cultural violence in the deep past look like? Um, and it could be things that symbols and iconography, special clothing, types of weapons, flags, all those things that say volumes without saying a single word. It's that kind of cultural behavior that really, really makes violence cohere and become persistent in human groups. People talk about it as the violence iceberg or the violence pyramid. And as you can see, what this indicates is that physical violence, the number of war dead, is the least of our worries. It is the tip of the iceberg. It is the structural violence that we have to go after if you want to eliminate violence. And it is the cultural violence. It's the, the, the way that we sort of look the other way and don't even think about what drones do in Pakistan, for example. So, so another way to think about this, um, and there's a whole kind of set of really complex theory, but I'm, I'm still struggling with it, but it's basically called rhizomatic, because if you know a rhizome plant, you have a shoot that comes up, and think of that as a, that's a violent event, that's a massacre that occurred, say, in Syria. And then here's another thing, another event of violence. And what, this is visually meant to convey that in violence theory, it's this entangled web that comes before the event that is underneath the event and that will continue on into the future. That these tiny events that you're seeing or that historians say, well, World War I went from this date to this date, it was really all the things that led up, the things that underwrit it, and that all of the um, complications that continued and to some extent were still grappling with the ends of the Vietnam War and even the Korean War and even World War II. So the rhizomic, if, if, I'm just trying to give you some visuals that, that violence theory is really cool because it, it allows us to think about if we just try to stop the physical violence, we're not getting to the problem at all. I mean, all the laws and all the policemen are not going to dismantle the structural violence, the structures within our society that have created inequality. And I think these are universal. I think they go cross-cultural. I think we can go back in time with them. Um, a lot of people use this image, too, to think, again, that direct violence is the tip of the iceberg. So yes, I would love it if nobody, no human ever hurt another human. But more what I want to do is dismantle the structures that keep violence around and the cultural practices that make it seem normal, that this is what we do. OK, so if I can uh, take you along with me that violence operates as a cultural system. There's no checklist, it's infinitely um, variable. It defies cross-cultural definitions. What's violence to me is not what's probably was my, what, what, what an ancestral Pueblo person would have considered to be violence. That we already know this linguistically, that we have many ways of thinking about violence that come right out of our colonial Western experience. And it's really hard for us to get outside of that. <clears throat> But here's the really important point then. It's the social and cultural dimensions of violence that give it power and that give it meaning. So if we want to not just say, I see 
some physical violence went on here and this must be a massacre. If we want to say, but what did it mean? What did it mean to the people at that point in time? We have to really start to think about violence in this more systematic way that allows us to integrate physical violence with structural violence, with cultural violence. Um, so the narratives that get reiterated, and I know I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of, there is some really good research out there, but the great majority of it is mostly that in the ancient Pueblo world, it was all male warfare, plus maybe some of this stuff, we don't quite know what to call it, these extreme processing events, maybe it's cannibalism. And everybody has really tried very hard to fit everything that they're seeing in the archaeological record into either war, not war, cannibalism, not cannibalism, violence, peace. And these binaries are ridiculous because war is a continuum. Violence is a continuum. All of these things are a continuum. Peace is not the opposite of war. You can have peace where it's, it's, it's peaceful on the surface, but it's peace because people are being incredibly coerced to do things they don't want to do in order to not have more overt, full-out warfare. So I don't believe that cooperation and collaboration is the flip side of violence. I think we have to start thinking of violence as, as a cohesive cultural system all unto itself, just the way we do economics and politics and religion and technology and all the other things that make up a human group. The biggest problem that I have with a lot of archaeological um, research on, on when they do mention is they sort of paint these scenarios where violence occurs in Pueblo one period, then it disappears and we don't see it, then it occurs again in Pueblo three period. It's almost as if that, you know, it's these isolated incidents and they sort of drop out of the sky and then when we get into a new period and you don't see the things that you thought were signals that you had violence, then it's the violence is now gone. That this is a ridiculous way to think about it, that any uh, event of violence, it's gonna have a history to it. There's gonna be bits to explain that violence that go way back into the past, and that act of violence is gonna have implications for everything moving forward. So I would like to muddy up the way we think about violence in past societies, and I'll use the Pueblo just as an example, but I think you could play this out with almost um, you know, any group that you were interested in investigating. And I pose the question to, to you. Um, instead of the previous models, the either or, what if we reframed violence in a different way? Um, remembering that these are non-Western, non-colonized, indigenous people with their own systems. It, you, ha you can't bring our notions of the Vietnam War to talk about Pueblo warfare. It's a ridiculous thing. Um, I believe Pueblo violence was very integrated. I think it sort of was part of political and social behavior. And I do think that there are parts of violence that are regenerative. I'm not saying violence is good. I'm just saying that the people who perpetuated violence had a reason, a deeply profound reason that propelled them at certain times and certain places in the ancient Southwest to carry out acts of what we're calling violence. I don't know if they would have, but just as a proxy, we'll use the term violence. If we see violence as regenerative, that is, that brings something new to the group that perpetrated it, that, that out of the ashes of something really bad, something new comes into the community, or they're able to get rid of something that's causing them problems, that's regenerative. Um, so we would see violence then as a specific form of communication, and it may even be that the communication isn't just between people within a community, but people that are living with their ancestors that are now gone. So it could be between natural and supernatural. If we see violence also as an act of reproduction, instead of just chaotic um, diminishment of human life, what if we saw it as out of death and destruction, something quite new could emerge that might be actually helpful to the continuing um, viability of the community? And what if we saw violence as a fundamental necessity that ne led not only to social disorder, because that's what everybody assumes, that this is like, this is a world out of balance when you see so much violence, but what if that balance was really just as a way to get to a new social order that would sustain and take people into the present? So if we think of violence in general as regenerative, what if we thought of warfare as reparative, that, that it had the ability to repair something that was really broken? So here we can think about promoting cooperation and group cohesion. Anytime you get male coalitions to go out and cooperate to do something together, that might be an act of violence in and of itself that is, is part of a good thing. Um, 
Warfare could provide access to resources that people don't have, it could affirm identities, it could affirm the social order, and it could provide routes to status and power to people who prior did not have that. So this is a different way, just a different reshifting, and maybe it'll just be for you guys tonight, a way to wrap your head around a slightly different way to think about violence in not so black and white terms and not so Western terms, but to open up to the possibility that because we have violence going back as far as we have humanity, they used to think hunter-gatherers were egalitarian. There's a whole book that just came out, I'm sure Jim Watson knows it. Um, it's called Violence in Hunter-Gatherer Groups. Violence has been with us forever. It's part of who we are. It's not genetic any more than any of the other features of what it means to be human are. That it's a tendency and it's in a set of behaviors that get certain kinds of results. So if you keep that all in mind, you might be able to sort of see where I'm going with this. Um, so I'm going to give you some evidence for this alternative narrative. You can buy it or not. <clears throat> but let's go back to what everybody's basing a lot of this on, which are these disarticulated human remains. So Christy Turner published this book, which I was so sad to see, went from hardback to this glossy copy, coffee table size <laughs> paperback. So people are still buying this thing. Um, it's sold at national parks and in gift shops. It just it breaks my heart. Uh, Turner took 76 sites, and he said, I'm looking for some key things here. I'm looking for, originally he had 14 things he was looking for, but when he didn't find all those things, he got it down to six things that he did find pretty regularly. He's looking for bone breakage, cut marks, anvil abrasions, burning, and mostly a representation of long bones, like you're not finding the ribs and the hands and the small bones. And he did a, a superficial looking through the literature and found that in some groups that practice cannibalism, when they um, start processing the body, that there is breakage involved, there's cut marks involved, they may be wanting to take large pizza, pieces of meat, and so they would leave behind things like the vertebrae and the ribs and the, the carcass. Um, and he partially uses an animal model for this, thinking of how if when we butcher large animals. So he was in his mind thinking, Every time we see these, I'm going to call it cannibalism. That's what it has to be. It can't be anything else. Um, if he only found four of these things or three of these things, he said, well, it's not cannibalism, but I'm going to call it violence. It goes into the violence category. So of these 75 sites that had disarticulated or these extreme processing events, half of them he decided he had five criteria, half he did not. And you can see the distribution over the time periods. And this is where, on the model I showed you, everybody comes to the conclusion that something big was going on in P2, P3, because that's where the majority of these disarticulated remains were found. Not so much in P1, not so much in P4, but this was just 75 sites that Christy Turner happened to get access to in various repositories. And I would argue it's the P2, P3 sites that have been excavated far more um, intensively over the last 50 years than a lot of P1 sites or P4 sites. So, um, so this model technically maps onto some of what Christy Turner found. But here's the thing, in 2014, Tim Kohler um, went through the literature and he collected other publications after Christy had published this book that came out that had disarticulated remains. Um, and he decided to throw in not only everything that was disarticulated, but also people who seemed to have fractures, maybe at the time of death, or people who had healed fractures. So he just created a, a, a really, really a, a nonsensical category called trauma that included anything that wasn't a normal burial. And so he added many more to these. And so in red, you can see now, when you add these other collections that have something going on that's not a normal burial, but we don't really know what to call it, you get 16% that are in P1 and you get 10% that are in P4. So now you have a phenomenon to me that's looking like it has deep cultural persistence, that it's not clustered, that, that, that model in the middle is not really mapping onto the data as we know it. And who knows, as we find more of these sites, we might find more in P1 and we might find more in P4. And then what we've got is cultural persistence. We have a behavior that has been practiced for a very long time in different sites throughout the Southwest. Um, there's a lot of problems that I, myself and many others have published about this book. Um, it, it's, in, it's circular. He, Christy says, if I find these five things, it's cannibalism. And then you ask him, well, so what are the signs of cannibalism? And he says, it's these five things. This is a very circular argument. Um, 
And this notion that if it's not cannibalism, then it defaults to violence it is problematic as well. It just doesn't open up the possible range of alternative hypotheses that would account for a body being reduced in uh, mass and size. Um, so what else could account? Well, let me tell you. Uh, I will go to my grave <laughs> thinking that at least some of these collections are executions for malfeasance. Um, we use the term witches and uh, sorcerers, but I don't know that ancestral people would have used those terms. Those are very Western colonial terms. So I'm just going to say execution for malfeasance, that people much smarter than myself, like Peter Whitley, Ogilvy and Hilton, and Andy Darling have written, they've poured through the Pueblo um, ethno-historic archival and folklore literature and have found that there's a, there was a deep, very deep and profound belief in these malevolent powers that can overtake the human body. And when you've identified that, it, it calls for swift punishment, anywhere from banishment from the community to beating to, to execution and severe dismembering. So in, in this article by Andy Darling, he, he points out that he went through all the historical records right up into to past contact and even to when Bandelier was working, doing archaeology in the Southwest, he, he himself had witten, witnessed some um, witch executions at Santa Clara. So this, this behavior was persisting, I think, for a very long time and was propelled by a deep cultural ideological belief. But you can see that there's multiple ways that a, that a, a type of malfeasance that was assigned to somebody. It could be that the bodies were just disposed of, but the bodies could be burned, hence the burning that we see in some of these. Um, the bodies could first be defleshed and then burned, um, and that they could be buried in a ver various places, structures, middens, abandoned structures. And this is, in fact, where we find a lot of these sites that Christie has called cannibalism. Um, the other thing that's important to remember is that uh, in the literature, they talk about that these, these, these individuals bringing bad things into the community have everything to do with what archaeologists care about tracking in the archaeological record. When were the droughts? When were the crop failures? When were the water tables low? What was causing the migration? And I think if you start to disconnect these cannibalism events that, that Turner identified, with some of these things that people are getting very fine, scholars are getting very fine-grained data um, to think about, we might start to see a bit more of correlation. They also felt that, the, that being um, somebody producing these bad things could run in the family. Uh, they also felt that, <clears throat> that anybody dealing with these individuals, that, that there's special curing ceremonies in Pueblo, um, uh, in Pueblo uh, folklore and ethno-historic documents, and that in, in the cosmological realm, you can never defeat these things. They're always in the background, just waiting, just waiting to kind of trip you up and make your community go under. So you're very vigilant about it. This research is all, if you would only read um, Peter Whitley in the Social Violence volume, he, it goes, it's a very long chapter, but he is, he is meticulous about detailing um, the evidence that exists that execution of witches had to have been pretty important because it remained important right up until um, it was outlawed in the U.S. So I would argue that some of these events, they're not, they're not a specific P2, P3, that they probably go as back as far as Pueblo ideology does and probably would have continued had not colonialism entered in. Andy Darling suggests that usually it's one individual or two individuals in the literature, um, the folklore that he read, that, that, that are targeted, which, it, which isn't executed. Hence some of these um, drawings that he found in the literature of, of individuals who were talked to by cultural anthropologists to explain their belief in sort of these, in quotes, witches and sorcerers that it was a small number. And, and if you go through the 75 sites in Christy Turner's books, three-fourths of them are, are represent <coughs> under five individuals, mostly one, two, and three, and up to four, maybe five. So I think at least three-fourths of these cases of disarticulated remains represent a very private and personal um, set of activities that were very much a part of the cosmology, of the belief system about responding to various things going on in the culture at the moment, the drought, the food, um, encroaching other people, 
Uh, so that these aren't just events that sort of drop down from the sky, right? They're, they're deeply embedded and profoundly important to people to carry them out exactly as they need to be carried out. So I'm going to throw away 75% of those so-called um, cannibalism events in my mind until we reevaluate all of them, and I think this is part of what we're seeing. Now, I have a grad student, um, Ventura Perez, uh, got his PhD like 15 years ago, so he's, he's not, my, not my kid anymore, but he was for a moment. Uh, he did a reanalysis of a great house site in Chaco Canyon called Penasco Blanco, where Christy Turner had located at the American Museum of Natural History um, some disarticulated remains. And Christy went through and he established that 85% of this assemblage of 1,200 bones, small pieces of the human body chopped up, 85% were broken, 8% had cut marks, 3% had burning, 9% had these anvil abrasions, so if you hit somebody with like a big rock, it's gonna leave a scratch on the bone. And it was missing vertebrae. Missing vertebrae, page 96 of that book. Ventura and I went back and we asked to see the same collection that Christy analyzed. There's the vertebrae. It was in the next um, cabinet, in but it was labeled very clearly Penasco Blanco. We found all the vertebrae. There's hundreds of vertebrae that go with this site. Um, Christy had all, ha already passed, passed on by the time we did this research. So um, we found the ribs. But one of the things, the most saddest thing we found is that Christy had marked in pencil on these bones, in these archival places, um, everywhere he saw cut marks. So those pencil marks were made by Christy and there were little notes in the box saying, check this out. Um, well, Ventura did check these out. In fact, he made casts of these cut marks, very fine casts that he could later go back, fill them in with a, um, a casting material and then make a thin section and look at the kind of cuts that were being made on these bones. Um, this is a cut mark from the Penasco Blanco material. This is a cut mark from Faunal. So Christie's saying they processed humans just like they processed animals. Cut marks on animals, cut marks on humans. We eat both, they, they both were eaten, right? So that, that's his, his model. You can see here the Penasco, they're much, much smaller, finer. And if you look at the kerf walls, which Ventura's on, I'm an expert in, because he was really interested in the type of tool that made these cuts. The kerf wall has these little bumps that are very characteristic of um, using something like, uh, um, <laughs> what is that, obsidian. Um, and generally when you butcher an animal, you don't use obsidian, you use something expedient like rhyolite or the, the, you know, the, the tool that's the most expedient and expendable. You don't use something like obsidian. And he found that these cut marks probably were with a more ceremonial tool like obsidian. So in A, you see Penasco Blanco cuts along some of the um, mandibles that we saw. And the B is a site that I've worked on in Mexico with Ben Nelson called La Quimada. That is a known place where there was a lot of feasting and killing of warriors and a lot of sort of body modification. And you can see visually that those are much, much deeper. Um, what we think is going on at Penasco, and I can't say this is for everyone, we would have to look at every cut mark on every bone, but at Penasco, we had a feeling that these, this was a secondary burial, that these bones were maybe laid out for a while and the, the, the soft tissue had desiccated enough and all they were going in was doing these really fine um, etching to get the rest of the skin off. And maybe then the bones were used or displayed. So Ventura wasn't so sure even that this would fit into violence. He was thinking it might be something like um, veneration. Um, so a different, a different way of thinking, at least of this collection that does have cut mark, that does have breakage, that does have burning, is that there was something else going on, much more complicated, some code of ethics or some code of how, how you deal with certain people. Um, and he's read a lot of the literature and he's worked in northern Mexico for the last 20 years. And in veneration, you do use bones over again and you show them and you move them around to special places. And the fact that these were found in I, I believe Akiva, or one of the more special places in, in this, one of these great houses, suggests that the placement was also intentional, that this, these weren't just discard into the midden. Okay, so Turner is on record saying what those cut marks represent cannibalism. Um, Ventura's also written his chapter in this book saying, no, 
He thinks this is ritual use of body parts, probably in a ceremonial context, probably over a long period of time, and that at some point some of the bones were scooped up and placed in a, very intentionally in the great house of Panasco Blanco. And he bases this um, based on the placement, the size, the depth, the width, and the tool used, and the context. Christie did simply a presence and absence of cut marks. It tells you nothing. You really need to know where those cut marks are. Ventura has carefully mapped where all the cut marks are. These are larger bones that they were interested in getting the skin off. Um, Ventura also found, thanks to the little pencil marks, that Christie, in at least a couple of occasions, um, misidentified sedimentation marks and trowel marks as ancient cut marks. So now we have two at least alternative hypotheses for these disarticulated remains that I think um, have to at least be kept in the mix until we have more data, until they can be tested by other people. They fit sort of a model of something very complex, something very unique to the Pueblo people that doesn't quite fit in our sense of was it cannibalism or was it not. <clears throat> Um, these three sites are in his book as being cannibalistic sites, and he found cut marks and breakage and the whole range. I also worked on this, these remains with um, Wolke Toll and Eric Blinman and Nancy Akins for over a period of four years. We have published in several places, most recently in this um, volume on commingled and disarticulated remains, which are chapters from all over the world where people do this kind of body reduction. The first site that he has is cannibalism. We can show, demonstrate 100%. This was post-mortem movement of burials. That often they would reuse a, a room block, they would excavate it, and if there was a burial there, it would just get sort of moved to another place. That all the breakage that we saw was ancient breakage. The burning, I don't even think was burning. It was just some bones that had um, staining on them. And so we ruled out that is absolutely not cannibalism. The second site, again, had so much carnivore damage, and there was a recent trenching activity through the La Plata <coughs> sites that were excavated, so we ruled that one out. 37592, very interesting. We asked Ventura to look at the cut marks. Um, we also had detailed site. These were intentionally placed. These bones were long bones, very intentionally laid out in a parallel fashion, cupped on the bottom and the top by two cranial vaults, very intentional. There's what some of the cut marks are looking. So here we have a La Plata cut mark and Penasco Blanco, really similar, very, very shallow. And again, there's a La Plata faunal bone. And this just show, shows you sort of the difference between when you're really in there cutting tendons because you've got flat, a fresh body and you want to get um, the meat off. It's very different. So whatever was going on, even if we have another alternative hypothesis to um, to the, to the veneration and the secondary burial and the, the use of these bones in some, some kind of ritual context that we don't quite know yet what the rules were. None of these are cannibalism. And so this model now, uh, you know, we have to add that at least in this period there were some really complex things going on that people were doing with the dead. Recent site that was excavated up around Durango, Colorado called Sacred Ridge. Um, in fact, my student Anna Osterholtz um, was one of the Hayden uh, prize winners and got this, her study, um, published in Kiva two years ago. So this site had 14,888 bone pieces, every single one of them tiny, small, smashed to quite small pieces and dumped sort of semi-intentionally, it seems almost, into um, a pit, a pit structure that then was, um, the timbers were pulled out and it was abandoned. But what Anna did for three summers, or three years actually, she was part of a CRM group, a team, they took all these tiny fragments of bone and they were able to, to, to start to put some of the bones to, to rejoin and confit, confit them back, um, conjoin them. The other thing that they found when they conjoined as many of the cranias as they can, could was that their the execution of these people was very systematic. It's almost as if they lined people up and hit them on the side of the head, and here's at least three. Um, and then there were other, that, that it wasn't just to kill people, that the bodies were, it, it, there's a name in forensics for this that's, I think it's called like overkill, but it's where you don't want to just kill the person. One stab mark would have done that, but you stab them a hundred times, it's that overkill. Well, that's what these bones represent. Anna focused on the foot, 
She was able to reconstruct a lot of them. And one of the things in comparing to known literature on the, the habit of beating the bottoms of the feet, which was done in many of the world wars and was done in, in smaller wars throughout the world and was done by the Israeli police. I mean, it's been written about in the forensic literature and the clinical literature. But beating about the feet does one thing, which is it hobbles your person. They can't really run. Um, when you beat people really hard on the bottom of the feet, it almost explodes the sort of soft tissue and the soft tissue that's connected to the bone and the bone sort of starts to break away. And Anna found symptoms on the bottom of the bone that were absolutely diagnostic of ha the feet having been beaten. And then she also saw that there were cut marks where they also sometimes just went ahead and sliced at the top of the foot. So her hypothesis was that this was a, a mass execution of at least 30, 33 people, MNI is the number of people we think are represented, men, women, children, infants. There were even some dogs that were um, in, in the pit and that were reduced. And so her, her and other people are coming to, to think about Sacred Ridge, and again, this is really early, Pueblo One, where we, up to this point, before Sacred Ridge, we didn't have this kind of large-scale massacre and or cannibalism event. She thinks people were tortured, executed, defleshed, burned, dismembered. There was trophy taking. She thought of the lips and the ears based on where the cut marks were. Um, she thought there was a lot of complex symbolism and ritualization going, again, sort of that people were executed in the same way. And she thought also that this had to have had an audience, that this was um, just based on where the bones were processed, which was on top of Sacred Ridge, and then the bones were carried and put in this pit structure kind of down, that there would have been other people involved. Um, she felt that this represented performative violence, which is very common the world over. What we saw go down in Rwanda with the Hutu and the Tutsi, that was performative violence. That was meant for you and I to see. They would often um, just, as people were running out of villages when they came in to slaughter everyone, they would just slice their Achilles heels, which, which would, would slow them down, their tendons, sorry, so they couldn't run, and then they would go back. They wanted everybody sort of dead in a very visual place. So, so this is not unusual at all, this performative aspect of violence. Um, so it has its own logic and its own sort of cultural meaning, right? So I'm just going to show you very briefly. Anna did, she did not make casts, and this has been repatriated, this material. She didn't have time, and they, they weren't interested. Um, but she showed, she very did these maps that are quite specific. Um, and I'll just give you, I want to mostly show you what we're talking about. There's cut marks, there's, um, these are those scrape marks, these anvil abrasions, percussive pitting. Um, and we would look for places for dismemberment where there's defleshing and dismemberment and they, have, they leave slightly different signatures on the body. Um, Turner would definitely have considered this. This fits all five of his criteria. There's no doubt that he would have said this was a cannibalistic orgy, which is, that's a term he's used in his book. Um, obviously, what Anna sees is that this is a strong reification, perhaps, of cohesion, identity, control, and that there's, when I say po poetics of violence, I mean poetics means that there's a, there's a theatrical piece to whatever's happening. There's, there's meant to be communication about exactly how this ritual is being carried out. And when rituals can be carried out in private, in closed doors, but when rituals are made public, powerful. That's how rituals get their power, is when they're, pu they're public. So the more public they are, the more powerful they are. Um, Tim White's book, I think Mancos is exactly like Sacred Ridge. In fact, Anna, for um, this book on commingled and disarticulated remains, and she's also edited another book on commingled um, remains. So she's kind of an expert now in this body reduction. She compared and contrasted bone by bone what Tim White published for the Mancos collection and what she knew from Sacred Ridge. They're identical. Um, this one's a much later. Remember, 700 for Sacred Ridge. Now we're into 1150. 33 individuals, 29 at um, Sacred Ridge. Similarities. The only differences were so nuanced, it was almost as if people knew the rules of what they were supposed to do, but they brought a little of their own nuance to it. So any of the differences she found were simply probably right-handed versus left-handed people, or that they processed the, the legs before they processed the arms, that it was that kind of nuance that differentiated, not the basic pattern of findings. Um, 
and again, so I would put Mancos in that it's, it was a massacre of a whole group of people, an extended family, a smaller enclave, 33 people, men, women, and children, and that this body annihilation was an important part. It wasn't just that they wanted to kill these people. That would be, that might be genocide, ethnocide, it, you know, a whole ethnic group being killed, but I, I don't think so. I think what you have is that it was really important to annihilate the body, to destroy the body, to completely take the body apart. <clears throat> okay, so I think this model, you know, I don't think that's cannibalism. I think now these EP events, we're seeing them really early, we're seeing them really later. Some of them are massacres, some of them are, I think, this veneration, some of them are witch executions, but none of them, I think, fit this model that these were ex exclusively cannibalistic activities. Um, you probably, some of you may know about Cowboy Wash, which was um, an article that came out in American Antiquity uh, several years ago, maybe 10 years ago, where same, same thing, um, only they didn't find as many people. I think that the minimum number was something like 10 to 12. But cut marks burning, the, the, the full, the full uh, treatment that if Turner had been alive and had seen this site, he would have said absolutely cannibalism. And this team decided, um, that it was cannibalism too. But they permitted a, a, a sort of point counterpoint by myself and Don Gosky and TJ Ferguson, who's here tonight. And we kind of carefully went through the paper and we found so many errors in just jumping from sort of descriptions of the bone to interpretations, um, that the data was really slanted to kind of produce only one outcome, that it was cannibalism. Other alternatives weren't even. Um, considered, but then they let them respond back to us and they basically said we were stupid and how dare we, <laughs> you know, that they're scientists and they wrote a really good piece of paper. Here's the sad thing about this site. At the same time Brian Billman was excavating this, he found a coprolite, a very small cop, tiny little piece of human coprolite in the fire pit near where many of the bones were found. He sent this off to one person who actually is the husband of a CRM archaeologist who was unemployed at the time, probably not important, but it was important to me. So she said, well, Brian, you should send this to my husband. He, he works at Colorado Medicine School of Medicine, and he said, there's human proteins in this coprolite. In fact, that's all that's in this coprolite. That this, 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 they were just feeding, and then, they, then they, they decided to do the ultimate. They took a dump right next to the people they had killed. So there was all this Western sort of narrative about this and this huge media frenzy. Carl Reinhardt has looked at more coprolites in the American Southwest than any human on the planet Earth. Carl wrote this really, this is in Science Mag Scientific American, from the heart of very profoundly influenced, it influenced me, notion of, of how that all played out he originally said, yeah, it looks human, um, and then he went off on sabbatical to Brazil. So while he was gone, Maylar did the analysis. Anyway, I want to read to you what he says here. Ideally, so he came back to this media frenzy. He says, initially I sat and watched the media feeding frenzy and internet chat debates with a sense of awe and post-sabbatical detachment. My original report suggested the copper light was not an, of ancestral Pueblo origin and this went largely unnoticed. The few journalists who did call me for an opinion proved uninterested in publishing it. In some cases, it was too far to fly to Nebraska where um, he teaches. In others, my opinion didn't fit into the nature of the debate. It was cannibalism, right? So, um, I love this where he says, uh, well, I have looked at more ancestral Pueblo feces than any other human being, and I do have an opinion. The ancestral Pueblo were not cannibalistic. Cannibalism just doesn't make sense as a pattern of diet for people so exquisitely adapted to droughts by centuries of hunter-gathering and traditions of agricultural innovation. So, so this gives pause. So people, so many people have said, this proves it. There's proteins in that. You know, from the get-go, I said, that's a carnivore. That, that, th there was no, there was not a single bit of corn in that copper light. It was so small that I've asked Carl a hundred times, and he said, I've seen a lot of, he said, it's hard to tell dog carnivore copper lights from human. But, and it was a small piece, and it was very degraded. Um, and then he went off on sabbatical, and then the protein analysis was done. So I think today he would think, you know, what they probably had was probably a carnivore copper light. 
But I will tell you that Cowboy Wash, we think now, I do, that was a massacre for sure and total annihilation of those bodies. Um, and we see simula similarities much earlier at Cave 7, which very few people have looked at the bones of Cave 7. This is a really early site, 300 AD up in Utah. But from what I can read, it looks like a massacre and annihilation of the bones. Um, Rattlesnake Ruin, if you've ever read about that site, I think is massacre, annihilation. There's something called Snyder's Well, which is in Christy Turner's book as a cannibalized site. I think when I look at it, I see massacre and annihilation. So the point is here that ritual destruction of the bodies was really important to them. It somehow fit into some larger set of logical thinking about the appropriate things to do to protect those that they loved. So I, I think this just shifts how we can think about this. Finally, I don't know if you've read this book that's out, but Awadabi and Palaka Wash are also in Christy Turner's book as sites of cannibalism. But these happened in 1700. So we had eyewitnesses who talked to ethnographers and other historians. Um, and so there's these ethnographic accounts of what went down. And so we know quite well the story, and it's been retold now by James Brooks in this new book. Um, one community um, on the Hopi Mesas attacked another community at the precise moment that the men were all down in the Kiva doing <clears throat> ritual initiations. Um, most of the men were killed. A lot of the women and children were taken captive. They were marched out. Palaka Wash is a, a bit of a ways from Awadabi. Um, but when you look at the bones of the people, th then there was an argument. So it's a quite long, involved um, s narrative about what went down here, which is fabulous because we don't have narratives for the other ones. Um, Brooks sort of summarizes that the Hopis lived in a society in which cycles of ritual acts of purification were deeply ingrained. And so he and many others see that some of these massacres of, of one group against another that had previously been neighbors and friends and now were um, deemed to be someone that had to be destroyed and not just killed but annihilated those bones really um, taken their humanity washed away from them so these kinds of things defy categorization using our Western notions and I would argue even this notion that now everybody's going around calling them EPs I find that kind of a, not offensive but it's just in, inappropriate and it's not precise and it's not scientific and it doesn't really let the data speak for itself and the data needs to speak for itself within each context. You can't lump all of these together and look at them as um, Tim Kohler has done to try to see broad trends over hundreds of years. You have to stick with these sites within their location because that's where a lot of the explanatory information is going to be. So this model I just think, you know, it's just wrong on every level. I wanted to tell you there was also uh, two infants, 12 children, 14, 16 adults. So the, the numbers are approaching some of the numbers that we've seen in others of these massacre events. Uh, another site, Sand Canyon, and this one's quite late in P2, P, early P3, 1240. Uh, massacre and body annihilation took place. Here's the thing, this site was only 5% of it was excavated which means we're missing 95% of the bodies, we're missing 95% of the archeological information. But on this five, based on this 5%, um, the authors have suggested that this was um, an act of uh, definitely some kind of one-time event where people came in and were murdered and slaughtered. But what I see is a lot of similarity to Sacred Ridge, to Mancos, to Awadabi, to Palakka Wash. So I see incredible con con cultural continuity and persistence of these kinds of behaviors through time. Uh, the MNI was only eight, but if we take eight and multiply it, you know, if we had excavated the whole site, I think it would have probably gotten up into the 40s or 50s. Um, again, if Christy Turner had been alive, cannibalism. Uh, so this, you know, and this notion that there is peace between P1 and P3, 4 is, I just, I mean, peace, again, peace doesn't have any contextual meaning in this kind of situation. We're not looking for war and peace. We're looking for complex people who had lots of complex ideas about how their world um, should be going. Okay. So if I played with this model, it would have so many arrows and so many things crossed out that we, we wouldn't really even use that. Uh, another site that I worked on, Castle Rock. Here's the thing about this site. I think we have one possible case of anthropophagy. And I say this because I also think there was massacre and body annihilation, but somebody carried several long bones of several males and kind of stacked them at the kiva, at the, at the kind of as you entered into Castle Rock. 
It was like a, you had to kind of pass by this kiva to get to the rest of Castle Rock. Um, and those look more like some of the cases of cannibalism that I've read about from New Guinea, kind of known places where people have prepared and eaten <coughs> human flesh. Um, we published this. My co-authors, a lot of Crow Canyon, really good scholars, really wanted to emphasize the cannibalism. But I think this might just be one case, one little nuanced sort of act of, who knows, defiance, some rogue folks who, um, who, or who were told to um, hold back and, or to stay with the, the dead and truly hadn't brought any food. I don't really know. There's lots of alternative hypotheses. But I actually think at this site, there might be something that might be cannibalism. 500 bones um, that represented three people and then 800 bones that represented a lot more individuals. So I'm just gonna speed up a little here. Um, if we look at this then, I, I think it's really problematic when we start to say that things have to fit into the Chaco period and they have to fit into the Aztec, the moment that Chaco declines and then we have Aztec. I think it's really hard also when you see some things clustering that you immediately start to say they didn't happen before and they didn't happen after. I think that completely shuts down any sense that you're gonna to get to sort of a much more nuanced understanding of what would happen. I think we can identify at least three persistent and distinctive Pueblo forms of violence the veneration, execution for malfeasance, and then these, these massacres, which are not massacres just to kill people. They're massacres to annihilate, to make those humans no longer human. Um, so I will tell you that we also find a lot of non-lethal violence in the Southwest. At the precise moment that you have these events going on, massacres, um, use of the body of the dead in different ways. We have a lot of sustained, serious, non-lethal violence, head wounds on men and women. Um, I've looked at, uh, between myself and my grad students, we've looked at lots of collections throughout the Southwest. Um, and one of the things I wanna show you is that the males, it's interesting, more of them have round or elliptical depression, so they're sort of maybe hit kind of in face-to-face -face combat with some kind of large projectile, like a large um, blunt force object. Females have much more variable, like they were almost hit with a range of things, and, and a lot of them were also in the back of the head. So females kind of enter into violent interactions one-on-one, -on -one, non-violent. These people, these are healed cranial depression fractures, so these people survived, but they are forms of violence. Somebody hit these heads. These are not accidents. There's a um, fairly good forensic and clinical ways to distinguish accidents in hitting your head versus blunt force trauma in hitting your head. So on top of all these other things, here's another form of violence that not very many people are talking about that certainly existed. My own research for the last 20 years, I've published this so much I'm embarrassed, but I think at this site of La Plata, we had a small group of women who were essentially captives, who were forced to do a lot of labor. They had arms that were asymmetrical and a lot of muscle um, attachments that suggest they were working really hard. Um, and they were, here's just quickly, I'll show you. So a lot of healed, they were beaten about the head, but not killed, they survived it. But eventually when they died, they were kind of thrown into abandoned pit structures. So here's a woman who survived a huge blow to the top of her head. She had a lot of pathology on her lower body. And then when she died, and another one with pathology in the crania and the head. So I think in addition to these massacres, you had low level raiding, maybe raiding for women and children, which is so common the world over. Um, in fact, slavery I think was so persistent in the ancient world that it would be unusual to not have had a form of bringing in individuals who are captives or slaves. Um, my graduate student recently reanalyzed a lot of Chaco outliers, and this one site, King Vignola, an outlier to Chaco Canyon, he found 60% of the females had head trauma and a lot of the signatures that we saw in the La Plata women. So I think this notion of captivity, now that we've entered it into the literature, maybe people will look for it when they do have access to skeletal collections. Um, Tim Kohler has promoted this idea that um, throughout the Southwest at different times, they may have been raiding for women as well. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna skip to the end. In sum, I think the violence that we see has nothing to do with warfare as we know it or cannibalism as we know it. I think it's performative, it's symbolic, it communicates certain kinds of things that we're not privy to. We may never know what it communicated. And I think that's okay because I think we're on the right track. 
um, I think it has persistence across time and space that in our, in our rush to kind of make things easy to see and categorize them into models, we've smushed things into categories that simply shouldn't have been because you lose the variability and the variability is what's important. I think social violence can be regenerative. I think warfare can be reparative. And I think that that's a better model, that that fits along with what we know of Hopi ethnography and Pueblo Indian ethnography. Um, so these different ways that violence manifests itself in the Southwest that have longevity, that go across hundreds of years, I think need to all be stay in the mix of how we think about this. So this is my last slide. No apocalypse. If um, those of you who knew Linda Cordell, and ever heard Linda Cordell, her famous, I love this, she would always say, Deb, there was a drought a minute. They knew how to deal with droughts. That I think we can't put so much emphasis on these periods of drought and resource restriction. I do think people, and research today is telling us, in parts of the Sahel, where people are starving, they're not pulling out guns and shooting people. Violence is not what they're doing. They're networking, they're moving, they're trying to get more goods from other people. And mostly what they're doing is migrating. Migrating, drought and migration might be much more related than drought and violence. Um, I think this was integrated strategic cultural activities. Um, I think if you look at other burial reports, what we, we show is that from the first ancestral Pueblo person that we've looked at in Pueblo One to the ones in Pueblo Four, they are carrying an endemic load of iron deficiency, systemic infections, it was tough. These were hard times. I mean, you're a farmer in a marginalized, dry environment. You're going to carry a morbidity load. But I think they understood that, and I think they did a lot to mitigate it. Um, I think this is unique to Pueblo Indians. So any of these strategies that I'm suggesting might not be what the Apache did, might not be what other indigenous groups did, or there might be some similarities. But until you ask the question and start comparing cross-culturally, you simply won't know. Um, I'm going to end with a quote by Ned Blackhawk, who in a book that was very influential for me called Violence Over the Land said, until we acknowledge the culturally meaningful role that violence plays for ourselves, no less for others, there is no chance of avoiding our violent tomorrows. Thank you.